You're very welcome to the Portrush Heritage Group Showcase event. We welcome Keith Brown, a member of the Heritage Group Committee, who's going to tell us about Portrush Harbour. The earliest depiction of a harbour of Portrush appears on the 1580 swift map of Portrush Peninsula. This was a rocky inlet at the southern end of Remora Head and sheltered from northerly and northeasterly winds by the massive bulk of the headland. This inlet was later developed as a more accessible harbour and improved by the additions of wooden jetties and steps. It is today what we know as the Old Dock. It is within this harbour that we find the Pilgrim Steps, used by immigrants to board small boats to take them out to larger ships and thence to North America. During the medieval period, the harbour would have been used by many of the Spanish, Spanish and French fishermen fishing local waters to provide essential protein-rich food for the population of these countries. It is also known that during this period, considerable trade was carried on between the north coast of Ireland and many other continental European countries, including several of the Baltic nations. In the 18th century, Portrush had become an important port for importing and exporting cargoes for merchants in the nearby town of Coleraine. Whilst Coleraine did not have its own harbour, this was to be reached by crossing a shifting sandbar at the mouth of the River Ban, and then navigating that river up to the town. Neither was easy in good conditions and with a high tide, but in bad weather and with low water, the task became virtually impossible. In 1826, a group of Korean merchants and principal landowners came together to finance and construct a new harbour at Portrush. The eminent engineer, John Rennie, son of the previous engineer who died in 1821, persuaded the company to adopt a revised scheme which would result in the much larger harbour we see today. At this point, some 100,000 tonnes of rock had been torn from the headland and placed in the two piers. By 1829, ships were using the new harbour and in December, John Rennie noted that the North Pier was now 402 feet, some 122 metres long, and the South Pier 230 feet, some 70 metres long. By 1835, the new harbour was complete. It had cost £18,048, three shillings and eightpence, and closed approximately 10 and a half acres of water and could float vessels up to 500 tonnes at any time of the tide. Over time, the harbour would see many changes in its use. The area left by the removal of Crana Hill would become a coal yard, then home to the RAF Marine Craft Unit, and finally the location of Waterworld, a council-owned indoor water play park. The South Pier would become home to bathing boxes, diving boards, steps, and two tethered rafts. Local entrepreneurs would set up businesses hiring out ro ro rowing boats to holiday makers or providing refreshments to those using the beach and harbour from the tea and ices shop on the South Pier, now, re now rebuilt and operating as Babushka. Cargoes of many sort would be imported and exported, principally upon the exports being crushed basalt stone from Krigahulia Quarry. Passengers carrying ships, passengers carrying boats from Scotland and England would transport thousands of holiday makers and day trippers to and from Port Rush, and a container ship com shipping company Anglo-Irish Transport would operate between Port, Port Rush and Preston during the 1960s. A fleet of fishing boats, initially sail powered but later diesel engine powered, would operate from moorings in the harbour, with their catches being eagerly awaited and landed on the North Pier. The harbour would host swimming competitions and become the home of Port Rush Yacht Club and the RNLI. With the arrival of the railways in 1855, tracks would be laid to the harbour and these would be used by, for many years by the railway company and the Port Rush Bish Mills and Giants Causeway Tramway Company to transport goods and raw materials. Today it is a much quieter place with little commercial or passenger traffic apart from the occasional cruise ship anchored, anchored in the West Bay and landing its passengers by tender. A small number of boats offer sea angling trips, undertake a little commercial fishing or running sightsee trips around the coast. Moorings are much better organised and the harbour has become a marina for pleasure craft. The bathing boxes and all the diving and swimming equipment has gone, as have all the remnants of the harbour's commercial port. We welcome Molly Byrne, 
who's going to play Leaving Friday Harbour. We welcome Sheila Stewart, who's going to tell us an Ulster Scots story called The Best of Friends, Best of Friends. Two women chatting in an Ulster Scots dialect gives rise to a little misunderstanding. My God, Sadie Campbell, is it you? I haven't seen you this lifetime. Where have you been? Aye, it's me, all right, Martha, and I'll tell you where I have been. Sick as a dog I was, laid flat out this past six weeks. Ah, oh, dinna tell me that, Sadie. What happened ye? Come on over here and sit down and I'll tell ye all about it. Well, it all started with a wee red spot in my back, and boys of dears it was itchy and wild sore at the same time. Then Mare appeared, so I took myself off to the doctor. Dr. Shawskate was, oh, he's a lovely wee man, and he says to me, Mrs. Campbell, ye have shingles. What, says I, shingles? Ye could have knocked me down with a feather. Says I, sure it's only old folk get the lake of that. Oh no, he says, children with chicken pox can pass it on to anybody. And you know, Martha, the wains at the school had it, and me working in the kitchen picked up the bug. It just left me fit for Nathan for six whole weeks. Old Bella Johnny's ma had to come down and cook and clean and gurn about it into the bargain. I couldn't say anything to her. I just had to thole it along with the shingles. And poor Johnny had to thole it to. I couldn't let him lay a hand on me for six whole weeks. Well, I never heard worse, said he. They say the pain with shingles is desperate. But I, I don't understand about Johnny not laying a hand on ye. Uh, do you mean ye and Johnny? Um, how can I put it? Uh, still have like, relations? Oh, certainly me and Johnny have relations all over the place. My Johnny has a very big connection, you know. Aunts, uncles, cousins. Oh, I didn't mean that kind of relations, ye idiot. I mean, like, intimate relations. Oh, I get you now. Them kind of relations. Oh, yes, my Johnny is a very regular sort of a body. 
you can set your clock by him every Saturday night on the dot at 10 o'clock. You can see him building up to it all week. Come Saturday, he's like a coil spring raring to go. Oh, I don't know how you can stick it, said he. I put a stop to all that, carry on with my William. As soon as a wee lad was born after the twa wee lassies, I was, it was out with a double bed and then with the twin beds. Says I to William, there'll be nae mere hanky-panky in this house. And I never had a bit of bother from that day to this one. Well, now I can why William Close goes about with a face as long as a lantern spade. You're a hard woman, Martha Close. But here, wait till I tell you. My Johnny got and sell one of these smart phones. He's took to it purple wheel like a duck to water. He's on this tinternet every turn round. He can shop an all aunt. He has bought a wheen odd things, and they all come wrapped in brown paper parcels. There's a pair of fluffy handcuffs hanging over the heat of her bed. Says I, what's them for, Johnny? And he just looked at me with a wee funny grin in his face. I'll tell you later, he says, but he hasn't told me yet. And here, he's got this book, Fifty Shades of Grey, it's called. Reads it every night, he does. He says it's all about a new breed of sheep with grey fleeces instead of white. He's thinking of getting a wean for the farm. Do you know, I'm starting to dread the postman calling with any mere brown paper parcels. He looks at me a bit funny like and he's winked at me last week. I didn't even know where to put myself. Look here, said he. Listen ye to me. You need to take a firm hand here. Your Johnny must be having a midlife crisis. A what? A midlife crisis? It's when some middle-aged men folk lost the run of themselves. It's like the blood eye rushes to their heads. They do daft things, acting like teenagers, dressing up in fancy clothes, putting gel in their hair and slapping on aftershave, smelling like a bed of roses, eyeing up young women. This smartphone Johnny has is a definite sign of something wrong with him. You hate to clamp down on him or he'll hear you jumping off wardrobes or swinging from chandeliers. And God only knows what other ideas he has in his head. Talk my advice. Tober and new before things get out of hand. Well, I don't know, Martha. It's all a mystery to me. But I know it's Saturday the day and Johnny will be up to high do. I hate to be off with myself now or I'll miss my bus. Granty, he had a wee chat with you, Martha. See you next week, Albin will. And Martha, here's a bit of advice for you. Push them twin beds together and put a smile in William's face. Ah, the best to you, Martha. Cheerio, Lou. We welcome young Portrush flautist, Laura Finlay, who's going to play Danny Boy or London Derry Air, call it what you will.
we welcome Ian McGee, who's going to give us a brief history of pantomime in Portrush. The year was 1952. Television was still only in black and white. Worse still, we had no choice as to which channel to watch, as there was only the BBC. Even then, programmes were generally only available from 5 to 11 o'clock. Port Rush still had two fine cinemas, the Picture House and the Majestic, and dancing could be enjoyed at Barry's by those with the necessary skills. December was a long, dark and usually dreary cold month, but this December would be different. History was about to be made. Earlier that year, Holy Trinity Church found themselves to be short of funds to support some of their Sunday school activities. So an enterprising group of church members came up with the idea of putting together a drama group who would stage a pantomime that Christmas. Thus was born the Ballywillan Drama Group. Fast forward then to the 18th of December 1952 and curtain up on Red Riding Hood with a cast of 17 actors and 18 dancers in chorus. Written and produced by Cecil Burley and O'Hara Logan, the show brought a shaft of brilliant light to local audiences just before Christmas. Colourful costumes, scenery and lighting, all the traditional pantomime characters, fun and laughter, a body in the shape of the wicked wolf who could be booed every time he appeared, and a fairy queen to defeat him. Add to all of these a bit of romance, and you have got a traditional pantomime. The first production was a great success, and the Sunday school finances increased by the then not niggardly sum of £70. 1953 then was the coronation year of Queen Elizabeth II, and the group decided to stage a review of five scenes portraying a tour of the empire, which took audiences to India, Australia, Canada, West Indies and London. If only India had no one, they might have objected as they had gained independence in 1947. 1954 saw the return of the pantomime with the classic Cinderella, which was so popular that the original four day run had to be extended by two days. Followed, in 1955 by Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, the group had now established themselves and the tradition of pantomime in Port Rush. Subsequent years saw the annual run lengthening to, to accommodate the demand for tickets. Famous names from those early days include Audrey Logan as the principal boy for seven consecutive years and Jack McGill as the never to be forgotten dame. He played the part on 10 occasions. Lindsay Walters, who also choreographed the senior chorus for two years, and then Victor and Rossi Duke, John Fleming and Lee Alcorn made regular appearances, with John having a fine singing voice and Lee being a popular crooner. Finales became works of art under the guiding hands of Peter and Derek Ross, and they grew in brightness, extravagance and glitter each year. In later years, it was said that the light support rush dimmed when Peter switched on the finale each evening. The 1970s and 80s saw a new generation taking on the mantle. Jennifer Diamond, Dawn Daly, Rodney and Jeffrey McGee, Jimmy Arnott, Joe McClelland, and of course, the never-to-be-forgotten Russell Galt. The latter part of the 1980s and the 1990s saw stage sets becoming more solid and a stage extension gradually worked its way in front of the curtains and across to the side wall of the auditorium. Peter Pan in 1988 also saw the group's first attempt at flying an actor into and across the stage. A very, very brave Karen Maguire put her trust each evening in a group of strong stage hands labouring in the wings. Bally Willen Drama Group were to stage pantomimes in the Town Hall regularly every year for 38 years, with one exception, 1967. The reason for pantomimes' non-appearance that year has been lost in the mists of time. Their 1990 production of the Pied Piper of Hamelin proved to be their last in that venue as Coleraine and Council were forced to close the Town Hall due to its dilapidated and unsafe condition, brought on by many years of neglect by that council and its predecessors. Ballywillan Drama Group found a new home in Waterworld where they had to create a theatre within the Piazza area. 
A stage was built with structures to support scenery, lighting and curtains. Access for actors was created backstage and seating was provided for their audience. This was a tremendous task which required ingenuity and hard work. And in this year, at least a firm of professional stage and equipment builders. But as often has been said, the show must go on, and go on it did. And Cinderella played to full houses in January 1991. Thereafter, the group built their own stage and associated structures, which was of great credit to them. This new venue required a rethink on scenery. For 38 years, the group had relied on back cloths, rolled up and down as required. But now this was no longer possible. Their veteran producer and director, Brian Logan, BEM, designed new sets that overcame the problem and allowed pantomime to continue in Waterworld until 1995. Aladdin, in 1995 was to be Ballon William Drama Group's last pantomime. During that year they decided to make the move from pantomime to musicals and they produced their first musical Oliver in January 1996 and continue to this day now in the Riverside Theatre Coleraine to produce high quality shows. A perusal of old programmes and Rodney Byrne's excellent book Look Behind You, 50 Years of Ballywell and Drama Group Portrush shows both the involvement of generations of the same families and the progression of individuals from fairies, chorus or dancers to principal boy, principal girl and other major parts. Some people appear for two or three years, others stay at a lifetime. The same is true for those behind the scenes, be it making costumes, building scenery, lighting the show, prompting or staffing the box office. To many people, both local and from far afield, January 1996 was lacking something. Snow? Ice storms? No, there was no pantomime in Portrush for the first time in over 40 years. Portrush Town Hall reopened after major refurbishment in 2005, but by then pantomime had been absent from the town for 10 years. And so it would unfortunately continue until 2016. For some time, an undercurrent of desire to see pantomime return to Portrush and especially to its natural home, the Town Hall, had been growing. And in 2015, this became a real possibility. A group of friends brought together the Portrush community to test the waters for interest in resurrecting pantomime in the town. The response was positive, and Portrush Theatre Company was duly formed. Work went ahead to put together all the necessary elements of script, cast, dancers, Chorus, sets, stage team makeup, costumes, etc., from scratch. And this they achieved, and in January 2016, very successfully staged Cinderella, the classic pantomime story, and a fitting one for a new group who also achieved riches from rags. Growing annually from strength to strength through Dick Whittington, Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves, and the Wizard of Oz, this young theatre company entertained large audiences from far and wide. Pantomime was most assuredly back on the menu in Portrush. Under the guiding hand of director Andy Byrne and for Dick Whittington with Andy Porter, the cast, many of them new to the stage, brought a wonderful show to the town hall stage. Portrush Theatre Company brought together young and old from all parts of our community. Some were old hands with previous experience, others were rookies, sometimes thrown on the deep end. But everyone pulled together to make the show successful. The measure of that success was evident in 2020 when, with Puss in Boots, all the tickets sold out before the show had even opened. To have the Town Hall Auditorium reverberate to laughter, songs and music was itself a delight to many people. A tradition has been revived in Portrush and we hope it continues for many years to come. Oh, Lord, oh. oh yes it will. I hope you enjoyed our presentation. Look forward to seeing you again and do look out for us on social media.